Prepare for a rude awakening. This is Michael Rood on the shore of the Red Sea, or in Hebrew, the Yam Suf, the body of water that the Israelites crossed on dry land nearly 3,400 years ago. In the final episode of the Sinai Connection series, we again turn our focus to the prophecies that are being fulfilled in our day and time. One of these prophecies was spoken by Yeshua, who told of the day in which his followers would be deeply disappointed in their expectation of his promised return. His delay would bring out the evil that was residing in their hearts, and instead of continuing to feed the sheep, they would respond with a false ministry of smiting fellow servants. Throughout history, we have seen this same pattern. Moses delayed to come down from Mount Sinai, so Israel built a golden calf. Samuel delayed to come to the sacrifice, so King Saul officiated the ceremony himself. When Samuel arrived, he confronted Saul, but instead of apologizing, Saul lashed out with his sharp tongue at the prophet. Because of this, Saul lost the kingdom. Yahshua said that it would be so in the last days. In 1999, I made a lot of enemies by declaring that Y2K was moot. December 31st, 1999 at midnight didn't begin the new millennium. It didn't begin a new year, a new month, or even a new day. The Creator runs this universe on His calendar and by His time clock, not a pagan reckoning of time fabricated by Babylonian sun god worshipers. After the Y2K prophets failed to deliver, they came after me with venomous slander. One of the most blatant lies that still circulates on the internet is that I set a date for the return of the Messiah, and since it did not come to pass, I am a false prophet. That is an absolutely ridiculous claim. I have adamantly declared for more than a decade that Yeshua is not coming back until certain things take place, and those things can't even begin taking place until the beginning of the seventh millennium, the day or millennium of the Lord. All of these necessary events are detailed in my first book, The Mystery of Iniquity, the legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah, first published in 1996. Yes, there are prerequisites to the Messiah's return, and we won't be seeing him in the clouds for several more years at the earliest. The vast majority of ultra-dispensational replacement theology pre-tribulation secret rapturists teach the Lord could return at any moment. That is false prophecy. Be a first-hand witness. Read my book. Don't listen to professional false witnesses who are incapable of telling the truth. Now, the final episode in the 11-part series, The Sinai Connection, Israel's Ancient Title Deed to the Land. I'm going to share this example because I believe it is very instructive to everyone. After I did the first 13 cities on the Prophecy Club tour, then the next Prophecy Club newsletter that came out, Stan wrote right under my name, there was about five speakers on the front, and he wrote right under my name, Michael Root is our most popular speaker this year. As soon as I read that, the Lord spoke to me and said, this is going to be trouble, and you are going to see the attack come from one of these people on this page. That's all I heard, that's all I knew. But when I look at Stan's words, I realize where Stan is coming from, People are coming out hearing about the Feast of the Lord. They're excited about it. They're having their friends come out. They love it. And so Stan is just saying, you know, this, this is a popular topic. Come out and listen to him. He wants everyone to hear this stuff. And he's worked diligently for years to get this information concerning the prophecies in the Feast of the Lord out to the rest of the world. Continues to make these tapes and send them out all over the place. So I knew that his heart was right nothing wrong with what he said 
But as I closed down each one of the prophecy club cities, when it was all over, at the end of that, one of these people that were on that front page started going around to all of the prophecy club people and started doing his own meetings, contacting all these people, having gotten their names, their email list, and started to do his own meetings. He ended up north of Duluth, just shy of two harbors. Two harbors is where my office is. My daughter and her husband run the office. Linda Miller, my private secretary and her husband, has been with me for many years. They attended this meeting that this person spoke at. Also, Gary and Mary Holcomb, which I led the two of them to the Lord, baptized them, and these people, their hearts were on fire. He was and still is a scientist at the National Laboratory of the Environmental Protection Agency. So at that meeting, they heard this person rail on me. His whole night was about how deadly evil I was. And just went on, on and on and on. This was his whole topic. His whole ministry was attacking me and exposing what a false prophet I am. And at the break, these people gathered around and Gary Holcomb said to him, if what you're saying is true about Michael Rood, doesn't the scripture tell us that, we should, that you should talk to him personally? That you should confront him on these things? Make sure that you have the facts straight before you say anything to anyone else? And he said, oh, I agree entirely. And I have done exactly that. I have called him and I have called him. I have left messages. He refuses to return my calls. I have sent him letters, I have detailed these things, and he refuses to ever write me back. I have emailed him, I have tried every way to contact him, and he refuses to own up to any of these things and refuses to answer. My daughter looked at him and said, Sir, you are a liar. We are his office staff. We handle every piece of email that he ever gets. He never sees anything unless it goes through our office first. We answer every phone call, every message that ever gets left, we're the ones that handle it. We open every single piece of mail, and everything you said is a lie. He turned white as a sheet and nearly passed out. He sat down in a chair, and the man that was running the meeting came in and just called the whole thing off because he didn't want his favorite false prophet exposed right there. After the break... He never said another evil thing about me. It's like the whole meeting changed. It changed completely. Four days later, he was in Milwaukee. And the whole night was how evil I was, right down the line with every single lie. He then went to Detroit and did the very same thing. A person can't be stopped. There's no stopping him. Because the truth is not What's important is because evil was exposed in his heart. He simply, you know, many years ago I had a wolf. It was part dog, part German shepherd, and part wolf. And it was given to me because the people that owned this animal didn't know how to handle it. Because wolves think differently. They act differently than a normal dog. And they look at every other animal and every other person as who is the highest on the pecking order. They will either dominate you or you will dominate that wolf. If you don't dominate that wolf, that wolf will kill you. It will rip your throat out because it's always watching for the day that it can dominate you. And so you watch how people respond and you will see what's going on in their hearts. You will see, if they act like a wolf, then you know what you've got. False prof, false witnesses, as we talked about. A false witness is one who speaks about something they have no firsthand information. And if you see something on the internet that speaks of something, then you need to find out right from the source 
Is this firsthand information, or is it something we keep repeating until we eventually destroy everyone's life surrounding it? Watch it. Because the evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. It exposed the evilness, and what does he respond with? He begins to spite his fellow servants. That is exactly what the delay is supposed to produce, what's in the heart. Now let's look on the other hand. The Lord says, but the righteous servant continues to give meat to his fellow servants in due season. Okay, the Lord's delayed his coming. Let's deal with reality, okay? Okay. You know what happened? That that particular person had to happen to be a Y2K prophet. That's where he made his living. That's the stuff he sold. That's how he made his living. And when nothing happened, instead of just repenting and say, I'm sorry, instead, he went out to lash out at the rest of the world because he did not want to repent. But the righteous and the just servant says, okay, I may have overreacted. I, I may have done some things wrong, but you know they continue to minister even if it cost them everything. Those of you who have been around long enough, you have seen that the Prophecy Club has gone through hard times. I know. Don told me of the day that he had to tell Stan that it was basically over. He had to fire his own family, had to let him go. But did that stop him from ministering? No. We had to deal with reality. I had, I had to do the same thing. The righteous servants continued to feed their fellow servants. Now, in Matthew 24, at the end of which I'm speaking, remember, there are no chapters, there are no verses. Right in the middle of a thought, a Catholic priest riding on horseback through France put a chapter. Forget it. Right at this very time, when the Lord delays his coming, The righteous servants continue to feed their fellow servants, and the wicked servants begin to lash out. Then, then, the very next word is then, which means at that time. Then shall the kingdom be likened unto ten virgins. Listen very carefully. At that time that the Lord delays his coming, to expose what's going on in his servants' hearts, just like the prophet Samuel, just like the prophet Moses did, just as we are given the example all through the scriptures, at that time the kingdom will be likened unto ten virgins who all had their lamps lit. They went out to meet the bridegroom. They were all Y2K compliant. They were witnessing. They were on fire. They were making things happen. Five of them were particularly wise, however, in that they took an extra vessel, and in that extra vessel, they took extra oil. When they went out to meet the bridegroom, and it says, while the bridegroom tarried, why did we not see it? Because we weren't supposed to see it. We were supposed to expect that he would come. We were supposed to expect that all these things bringing about the coming of the Messiah, the wars and all this, we were supposed to expect it. We were supposed to get ready. We were supposed to light our lamps. We were not supposed to sit on our dead rear ends for another year listening to the same dead sermons preached over and over and over, paying your 10% religion tax and never getting out and waking up the world. No, you were supposed to believe this is the time. When the bridegroom tarried, they all fell asleep. We didn't see it because we weren't supposed to. Now we're supposed to see it. Because while the bridegroom tarried, they all fell asleep. They couldn't see what was going on. They couldn't hear. Heaven was silent. They seemed to be just left holding the candle. Finally, their candles flickered, dimmed, and went out. Later that night, 
not the next day, not next week, not next year, next millennium. Later that night, the cry went out, Behold, the bridegroom comes. They woke up. Those that had the extra oil refilled their lamps and lit them. The five others, not so wise, they said, our lamps have gone out too. Give us some of your oil that we might light our lamps. And the ones that were a little bit smarter said, uh, I don't think so. We've been through this one before. You go out and you purchase oil from your local preachers or wherever you get your oil from, I don't know. And so while they went out to buy some oil, the bridegroom came, and those who had their lamps lit and were ready went with them. The rest of them were left behind. Where are we on God's prophetic time calendar? We are in that moment. We are in this very moment in the time that the bridegroom delays his coming to expose what's really going on in our hearts. And this is the time that we light our lamps and we go forth. We are to be a light to the world among all the nations. I am criticized quite often by many who say that I ought to be preaching to everyone that it's time to pack up and move to Israel. And I am criticized because I'm not telling everyone to pack up and move to Israel. By the way, I'm criticized by those who don't live in Israel, and I do, which seems to indicate something's going on. But as I read the instructions from my Lord, he said, go into the whole world and preach the good news to everyone. And as of right now, he hasn't called us off. I have seen no divine degree that says, everyone pack your trash and move to Israel. In fact, try it. Let's say that your last name is Cohen. Your mother's family and your father's family are Kohanim from Aaron. You've got their ketubah. You have your bar mitzvah, your certificate. You are married to your wife by a rabbi, and she is from the family of Cohen. You move to Israel, and they find out that you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. Don't even unpack your bags. You're gone. Those who are in charge of the land of Israel at this time, you're not welcome. Try doing it as just a believer who has no pedigree according to rabbinic authority. Unless you are supposed to be there by a command of the Almighty, and there are many that are, you won't be around long. Why? Because the Messiah said, go into the whole world and preach the gospel. And you have got to find that path in your life you have got to be in his will because when you are in his will, you are in the safest place on the planet. You don't have to pack your trash and move to some paradise in the middle of Central America to be safe. You simply have to be obedient to what he instructs you to do and make your testimony count. example that I always think back on is that in the end of the book of Revelation, it talks about these two witnesses who testify for three and a half years in Jerusalem and nothing can touch them. Enemies come up against them and the fire comes out of their mouth and, mouth and melts them like a bad marshmallow at a campfire girl's cookout. But yet it says when their testimony is finished, they are killed and they lay dead in the street for three and a half days. And I believe that that's when we're all going to die too, when our testimony is finished. So my advice is, get a testimony and drag it out as long as you possibly can, okay? 
And remember, our goal is not to live to the end. That is not the goal. There is not a single generation that has gone before us that has made it out of here alive. Don't think that we are some hot spiritual stuff and we're going to make it out alive. Okay, Elijah and like uh, Enoch. Okay, like two people in the history of mankind. And you're going to be the next? I'm just saying, let's deal with reality. Our goal is not to live to the end, it's to be faithful to the end. And if the end is tomorrow, then be faithful till tomorrow. Be faithful to the very end, to the very day. Because the Almighty is going to hold you in the palm of his hand. There is no temptation that has come upon you that is not common to man. But the Almighty is faithful. And he is able to hold you in the palm of his hand and protect you now and in the day of trouble. But do what he said to do. Light your lamp and get out there and wake up the world. This is your finest hour. This is when you open your eyes when the rest of the world is asleep because the next word you are going to hear if you faithfully carry out his instruction is the bridegroom has come. The bride has made herself ready and her garments are white. They're spotless. They're without wrinkle. There is not one hint a pagan sun god worship in the garments of the bride. She has made herself ready, and now the time has come. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you for being with us for our special series entitled The Sinai Connection, Israel's Ancient Title Deed to the Land. I invite you to join us again next time as we continue our A Root Awakening adventures. This is Michael Rood at the Yom Suf bidding you shalom, peace, and I will see you when the smoke clears.